and welcome. I am Esra Akjan, uh, the director of IES uh, at the Ainadi Center for International Studies. Thank you for joining our webinar, um, Belgium to Congo, Colonialism, Reparation and Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, organized as part of our migration series, whose theme this academic year is repair and reparations. Before I introduce our panel and the webinar procedure, let me say a few words about this event series. The migration series of the Institute for European Studies at Cornell University has been continuing since fall 2017, and it brings together panels that conceptualize migration, not only as that of people, but also of images, ideas, technologies, food, objects, and information. Among other things, this series aims to understand the historical and contemporary relevance of migration and critically acknowledge Europe's role in the history of modernization and colonization, as well as its character as an immigrant continent. The panels we have so far organized in this series included Academic Freedom and Exile, The Arts of the Immigrant Continent, Crossing the Mediterranean, Necropolitics of Extraction, Family Separation, and many more. You may find recordings on our website. The theme of our series in this academic year is repair and reparations. We hope to think together about several aspects of this theme in today's context, as the question of reparations has a newfound relevance in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement, and as the question of multifaceted healing has become urgent around the world with the current public health and related crisis. And moreover, as the question of repairs from climate change related disasters continues to loom in our planet's future. The multidisciplinary panels in the series brings together scholars and professionals to discuss the topics of repair, reparation, restitution, and transitional justice by drawing from the past and present experiences of Europe in a global context. So far, we have organized the panels, Hagia Sophia, Perspectives from Cultural Heritage, Beirut Reconstructions, and Repatriation of Museum Objects in the Fall. Our future panels this spring will be Germany to Germany, New Perspectives on Post-War, Post-Unification, and Post-Colonial Reparations, USSR to Post-Soviet Russia, reparations or repression for Stalin's victims, north to south, repair and reparations for climate refugees, EU to Bosnia, refugee reparations and global apartheid. So please follow us and attend those panels as well. This panel, Belgium to Congo, colonialism reparations and truth and reconciliation commissions in particular, will explore the theme of reparations and restitutions to bring justice to the residual inequalities caused by slavery and colonization. During the summer, several Confederate and military monuments were toppled or removed during the Black Lives Matter protests in Virginia, Boston, Alabama, Bristol, Antwerp, and other cities. With the while the future of commemoration is a topic in its own right, the monument discussions also sparked the base of accountability and right to truth. For instance, during the Black Lives Matter protests and monuments debate, Angela Davis mentioned a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a starting point for peace in the US. After the toppling of the statue of King Leopold II this summer, Belgium instituted a sort of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which will be the focus of our panel today. Approved in summer 2020 in the form of a parliamentary special commission, this initiative is meant to scrutinize Belgium's colonial past and to discuss reparations to ex-colony Congo. We will hear much more about this commission from its project leads and experts soon. Recognized by international law, the right to truth oversees the rights of relatives and society to know the truth about state brutality and human rights violations in the past which have been obscured due to the denial of responsibility and the distortion of facts in official and national histories. Truth and Reconciliation Commission is one of the mechanisms of transitional justice, 
a term that, as many of you know, is defined in international law as the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with a society's attempts to come to terms with a legacy of large scale past abuses in order to ensure accountability, serve justice and achieve reconciliation. Truth and recognition of suffering is therefore a prerequisite for healing. So this panel series starts from the premise that transitions from military regimes, civil wars, genocides, apartheid, as well as healing from colonization and slavery may be topics of the multidisciplinary field of transitional justice. Mechanisms include truth and reconciliation commissions, reparations, compensation programs, institutional reforms, memorials, and museums with education programs. For example, as part of this series, we organized Repatriation of Museum Objects webinar in October to discuss repatriation and restitution as a form of reparation to colonized and looted lands and to observe the responsibility of museums to objects taken into their collections by violence or deceit during the colonial times. Panelists discussed current debates on returning some objects from Sub-Saharan Africa in public museums in France and Germany. It might be useful to know that there are 90,000 objects from Sub-Saharan Africa in public museums in France, 69,000 in the British Museum, 75,000 in Germany, while the Royal Museum of Belgium, our focus country, this panel holds 180,000 objects. Far from being resolved, however, the right to truth claims have often injected a dilemma into the healing process because truth commissions that were established during transitional periods often secured amnesties to perpetrators in return for collaboration. A history of transitional justice might indeed be written by showing the dilemma between truth and criminal justice and the historical struggles in different countries to minimize it, such as the story of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission during South Africa's transition from the apartheid regime or the right to truth movement protests against impunity and trials for truth in Argentina. Transitional justice is unresolved also because subsequent regimes were usually far from perfect themselves and their truths and their justices were also partial. In many cases, results were compromising or if even flawed. Reparations functioned as whitewashing. Financial compensations were symbolic and institutional reforms gave unfair advantages to the new regime supporters. Moreover, the assumption of the objectivity and universality of international law is also rightly debated, and the framework to reconcile the international and place-based justice systems remain unresolved. Conceptions of justice among communities may differ. Societies may respond to violations differently. Methods that they use to find justice may also differ. Reconciliation may mean forgiveness in some countries, but punishment in others. Individual opinions about justice in a given country may be skewed according to nationalist and ethnocentric ideologies, may depend on social and economic factors, or change over time. When perceived as a toolkit that can be applied anywhere without translation, reparations foreclose a society's right to heal. So in the context of these unfinished struggles toward right to truth, the imperfect conditions of transitions and the unreconciled international and national laws, transitional justice needs to be conceived as a continually evolving, self-reflective and open platform where societies may formulate new forms of justice and peace building steps. Today's multidisciplinary panel will start from these broad questions and focus on the current debates on Belgium-Congo reparations. As a way of introduction to our panel series in general on repair and reparations, Pablo de Graef uh, will first make a presentation on the broader issues. Then uh, we will hear from Pedro Monavil, who will present on the history of Belgium colonization in Congo, followed by Amaido and Lilian Umambe, on the current debate around accountability, truth, and reconciliation in Belgium. We also hope to produce ideas about the place 
uh, about the place of this initiative in other colonialism reparations and transitional justice processes around the world during the discussion. Uh, and let me also introduce the procedure for the discussion today, uh, which I hope uh, will allow our speakers sufficient time to share their reflections and for our attendees to participate in the discussion. Each of our four speakers will make uh, about 15 minutes presentation. Upon the conclusion of this part, uh, there will be a discussion and a Q&A when I will make a selection of questions submitted from the attendees. You will be able to submit your questions for this portion by writing them in the Q&A tool that you can find at the bottom of your screen. The more direct, short and on topic your question is, uh, the more it will have a chance to be selected. And given the large size of our attendees, please refrain from writing your reactions or impressions so that I can sort through the posts efficiently. And we hope to conclude the panel in less than two and a half hours in total. Uh, before we start, let me also extend sincere thanks to our program manager, Pamela Hampton, who single-handedly ensures the smooth execution of all our events, as well as student workers and ambassadors, Alp Demirolu, Meili Berks, Natalia Gulik, and Andrew Lim, who help with social media posts, graphic design, and st student participation. So I'm very much looking forward to the presentations of our four speakers today and uh, the following discussion. I thank them very much for accepting my invitation. Uh, now let me introduce our first speaker. Pablo de Grave is a senior fellow and the director of the Transitional Justice Program at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice of the School of Law at NYU. Prior to joining NYU, he was the director of research at the International Center for Transitional Justice from 2001 to 2014. In 2012, he was appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council as the first special rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence, a position he held until May 2018. He served as an advisor to different transitional justice bodies in Peru, Guatemala, Morocco, Colombia, the Philippines, and among many other countries. Born in Colombia, uh, De Graeff uh, graduated from Yale University with a BA and from Northwestern University with a PhD. He was an associate professor in the philosophy department at the State University of New York at Buffalo, where he taught ethics and political theory. He was the Rockefeller Fellow at the Center for Human Values at Princeton University and held a concurrent fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities. The Grave uh, is the editor or co-editor of 10 books and has published extensively on transitions to democracy, democratic theory, and the relationship between morality, politics, and law. Yes, you may go. Thank you very much, uh, Ezra, and uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, very kind and long uh, introduction. Uh, of the sort that almost guarantees that what follows will be a disappointment in a different context, uh, uh, much less friendly than this, uh, discussing uh, uh, developments in transitional justice. Someone was criticizing the so-called transitional justice uh, industry. And he said, and you are the CEO. And he did mean that as praise, of course. So in any case, I am delighted to be here with you. I am very grateful for the invitation and I want to take the opportunity to congratulate you for the series. Uh, this seems to me to be a terrific idea. As uh, I mentioned to you when discussing uh, the event, uh, I am not here as an expert uh, on the DRC or even less on the history of the relationship between uh, uh, Belgium and the DRC. I accepted the invitation to talk about uh, the broad framework of uh, transitional justice and looking forward uh, to learning from my very distinguished uh, co-panelists uh, about uh, the case. So let me make a few introductory remarks about uh, transitional justice and why it may be of interest uh, 
in the current context, which, as your introduction pointed out, includes not just this case, but many others, including the situation in the United States. Transitional justice, and you also clarified this, but just to set a common understanding of the term as I will use it, refers to the efforts that countries have used in order to come to grips with the legacies of massive human rights abuses. And uh, although the uh, model developed not uh, as a result of uh, theorizing and not even as a result of pre-existing legal obligations, but in fact uh, contributed significantly to the development and the entrenchment of legal obligations uh, subsequently. Uh, eventually, consensus was achieved about some core elements of a comprehensive transitional justice policy, and those are basically criminal justice, truth-telling, reparations, and a series of measures uh, that are grouped uh, together under the awkward uh, and the relatively uh, unknown um, term, guarantees of non-recurrence, which refer generically to measures that are designed to prevent the occurrence of uh, uh, violations again. In any case, uh, this list of elements, uh, which is not exhaustive, and there are other elements that can be added to the list. This list of elements by 2004, they were referred to in the former Secretary General's report, the first report by UN Secretary General on Transitional Justice as part of a holistic uh, policy. And uh, he referred explicitly to the four elements and also argued that they were not akin to items in a menu from which countries could pick and choose, but rather that they constituted the interlinked elements of a policy of redress and prevention and that it was important to think about them uh, as such comprehensively, not as a random collection of initiatives, but rather as elements of a policy that should be uh, implemented uh, comprehensively if it is going to achieve its aims. Now, there are also questions about not just the elements of a transitional justice policy, but about uh, its uh, aims. The fact that this is a field that, that was born out of uh, practice and not either of theory or of the effort to uh, satisfy pre-existing legal obligations has meant, uh, on the one hand, uh, that uh, it is motivated by a principled but pragmatic motivation. On the other hand, uh, that it is uh, under-theorized still, and uh, that as a consequence, there are debates about the boundaries, but also about uh, its objectives. In my mind, I think that transitional justice uh, has contributed or can contribute significantly to four main objectives. First, to provide recognition to victims, and that is to provide recognition not just uh, to the victims in virtue of the suffering that they endured, as admirable as the endurance is, and as horrendous as the suffering has been, but primarily to provide recognition to them as rights holders. And I think that this is of fundamental importance. Secondly, I think that transitional justice measures, when applied comprehensively, 
can uh, provide an incentive for the development of basic civic trust, trust between citizens, but importantly, trust between citizens and the institutions of the state. Third, I think that transitional justice, when applied effectively, can make a contribution to strengthening the rule of law. And finally, and as a consequence of all of the proceeding, I think that transitional justice measures, when successful, can make a contribution to reconciliation, which is a term that I prefer to avoid and instead talk about a modest form of social integration. I think that these are the fundamental aims that transitional justice seeks to achieve. Now, in the history of the implementation of transitional justice measures, I think that there are some, uh, um, there's a different way of uh, analyzing its contributions. I think that there is, uh, there are some uh, uh, cross-cutting uh, contributions uh, that transitional justice has made, the first one being precisely the unpacking of the notion of justice. So although I consider transitional justice to be very closely related to the human rights project uh, overall, I think that compared to classical trans uh, human rights work, transitional justice uh, uh, has contributed a broader understanding of what justice requires, not just criminal accountability, but also importantly, truth-telling, reparations, and measures that are explicitly designed to prevent the recurrence of violations. The second cross-cutting contribution that I think transitional justice has made when successful is that in a certain sense, it makes uh, victims uh, visible. There are conflicts in which uh, particularly elites uh, think uh, that victims uh, are uh, non-existent non or of very little significant. Ezra mentioned I was born in Colombia, as many of you know, Colombia is trying to put to an end a conflict that started 57 years ago, exactly the same year I was born. And for decades, Colombian elites thought about the conflict as a victimless one, namely as a conflict that afflicted fundamentally the economic infrastructure of the country, but victims were nowhere to be seen. The Transitional Justice Project contributes to making victims visible, to giving them voice, to giving them a space in the public sphere. And I think that this is a fundamentally important uh, contribution. Third, although uh, far from perfect, I think that over time, Transitional Justice uh, has uh, made uh, some contributions and has uh, learned uh, some lessons about how to improve its gender sensitivity and its inclusiveness. And for instance, uh, there is no truth commission right now that would not take very seriously uh, issues about uh, uh, the impact and the differential impact of violence uh, on women and children. It is increasingly common for truth commissions to employ mechanisms of inclusion such uh, as national consultations and within each measures consultation mechanisms in order to improve uh, the communication between those mechanisms and the important uh, stakeholders. So I think that this is important. And of course, transitional justice has made very important contributions to fact-finding in general. And fact-finding is becoming increasingly important if you think about, uh, for example, the impotence and the shameful impotence uh, of the Security Council of the United Nations 
regarding uh, the situation in Syria, the regarding the situation in Myanmar, and uh, many others. Uh, this is still, uh, this is being partially compensated by the effort, uh, the very serious effort uh, to do serious fact finding and preservation of evidence that can be put to use in subsequent justice and truth seeking mechanisms. So I think that this is a contribution that is worth highlighting. And with respect to each of the elements of the fundamental core of a transitional justice policy, I think that transitional justice has made important contributions in giving content and life to the corresponding rights. So for instance, in the domain of justice, transitional justice has made very important contributions in learning how to cope and to mitigate the effects of amnesties, how to develop prosecutorial strategies. In other words, how to realize, how to make real the right to justice that is in fact the one that is most deeply entrenched in international law of all the elements of a transitional justice policy. But in the domain of truth, which is important for our discussion, as we know, there is no international convention on the right to truth. It is mentioned on the International uh, uh, Convention uh, on the Protection Against Enforced Disappearance and in other soft law instruments. But transitional justice has made a huge contribution doctrinally to entrench the right to truth and more importantly, practically to give life to that uh, right through mechanisms such as truth commissions, commissions of inquiry, and other uh, truth seeking and truth telling instruments. Uh, reparations, of course, has a long history in interstate post conflict uh, situations, but it was transitional justice that gave life to the right of victims in intrastate uh, conflict and that gave life to that right through mechanisms such as administrative reparations program with certain specific design features that have been extraordinarily important for victims, such as the design of complex benefits so that they are not just purely compensatory mechanisms, but rather uh, mechanisms that involve a, a diversity of benefits that respond much more closely, albeit still imperfectly, to the needs and uh, the rights uh, of uh, victims. And in the domain of uh, guarantees of non-recurrence, I think uh, that, that this is uh, a much broader topic that we should discuss. But again, I think that transitional justice has contributed both to putting this topic in the agenda and to put it in the agenda of the international community in a new light by focusing on nationally led initiatives. So I think that the contributions have been significant. Now, of course, it is also a field that faces great challenges. First, one has to accept that even in the successful cases, the task that transitional justice faces in a certain sense is an impossible one. There are violations that, strictly speaking, cannot be fully redressed. There is no one that can return to the situation ex ante. People that have been illegally detained for years, people that have been abused, tortured, they cannot, of course, bring people who have been illegally executed back to life. So there are very, very deep limitations. But having said that, I think that the contributions are important. I want to mention, however, some challenges that I think are important for our conversation. 
and that uh, includes uh, two in my mind uh, that are worth discussing. Of course, the model of transitional justice was designed for implementation after massive human rights violations within states and where the responsibility for the violations lied primarily with the state. So one can trace the model, the shaping of what we call transitional justice today to the Latin American countries of the Southern Cone and their efforts to come to grips with the violations that took place during the dictatorship. And that, that those are, of course, examples of an intrastate uh, situation and uh, the subsequent application to post-conflict contexts are also applications to situations of intrastate conflict. And there are very few experiences, successful experiences of uh, the implementation of transitional justice measures across national borders. And I think that much more thinking needs to go through, uh, to go into how this can be done adequately. Secondly, the model was devised to come to grips with the violations that were temporarily more or less proximate. And therefore, the implementation of the measures to redress what in the field we call historical injustices, which are temporarily much more distant, also needs to be thought through with much more care. And the, the final challenge that I will mention, because I think is relevant, is that as all fields that have formalized very rapidly, and transitional justice has formalized in an extraordinarily short period of time in, and um, in some ways has been successful at normative change at the international level in an unusually short period of time. All of this is great. However, the challenge that it generates is what some economists and organizational sociologists call isomorphic mimicry, the tendency to think that the very same institutional formations will work equally well regardless of uh, circumstances. And I think that that is an assumption that obviously deserves uh, to be examined very, very carefully. Uh, the, the field has become slightly technocratic trying to answer instead of the fundamental question of how best to satisfy the rights to truth, reparations, uh, justice, and guarantees of non-recurrence to victims. It has concentrated lately much more on what is the best way to establish a truth commission, what is the best way to establish a reparations program, and what is the best way of establishing an accountability mechanism, as if the challenge was simply one of uh, clever institutional engineering, rather than a much more normative, more political, much more from the ground up uh, effort to satisfy rights, which involves, of course, much more listening than technocratic advice. And in the context of this conversation, because this is in many ways a novel experiment, a novel attempt, I think that it is worth keeping in mind uh, the dangers of this type of uh, isomorphic uh, mimicry. But I want to say there's a lot to be learned from transitional justice experiences except that there is no model that can simply be copied in order to resolve a complex issues such as one that involves historical injustices. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I am delighted to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Ezra.
Uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Pablo, for this uh, very precise and wonderful um, introduction to the objectives, uh, contributions, and challenges uh, of transitional justice. And I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion at the end, uh, where I hope there will be a lot of conversation between the uh, panelists. Uh, now let me introduce our second uh, panelist, uh, Pedro Monavi. Um, is an assistant professor of history uh, at New York University Abu Dhabi. Uh, his research interests uh, include the history of decolonization, political imagination, youth movements, higher education, popular culture, and state violence in Central Africa, as well as the study of colonial memory in Belgium. His current book project uh, builds on the doctoral dissertation he defended at the University of Michigan in 2013. It explores the history of student activism in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, at the time of the global 1960s, showing notably how students contributed to conversations about authenticity, emancipation, and decolonization that transformed the Congo in the aftermath of independence. Yes. Thank you, Ezra. Thank you very much for the, the, the invitation. Um, okay. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, and show a few slides uh, while I'm uh, reading from my notes. Okay, so um, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, try to provide a, a comprehensive overview of the history of uh, Belgian colonialism in Central Africa in 15 minutes. I'm going instead to uh, group my comments around uh, the two most well-known episodes in the history of uh, colonial Congo, its beginning and its end. One defining feature of the debate about colonialism in Belgium as it has unfolded in the past uh, couple of decades is indeed that uh, it's, it's focused on uh, Leopold's red rubber regime in the 1890s and early uh, 1900s on the one hand, and uh, on the Congo crisis of decolonization and the assassination of uh, Patrice Lumumba, the first pr uh, prime minister of independent Congo uh, in 1961 on the other hand. Some historians, including um, members of the committee of experts who are currently working as part of uh, the parliamentary uh, commission on the colonial past and its uh, consequences. So some historians are called to expand the chronological framework of the public debate and to uh, identify blind spots in the scholarship about uh, colonial Congo, particularly with regard to um, uh, events illustrative of colonial violence that that should uh, that could and should be a part of processes of truth and, uh, and reconciliation. In general, the knowledge of colonial history in Belgium is clearly uneven. It is in part because of a long neglect for uh, the topic in history curriculums uh, across uh, Belgian schools, but also because uh, discussions of colonialism tend to happen around a limit, limited set of events and figures in a way that has silenced other voices and histories. Um, one example of these silences uh, is the question of sexual violence, uh, the question of sexual violence uh, against women, which has been uh, marginalized even in discussion of the free state, of the Congo free state and discussions of the uh, decolonization periods. In the first case, as historian Nancy Rosan showed uh, a few years ago, sexual violence was mostly left out from the denunciation of King Leopold's red rubber atrocities by people like uh, Edmond Morel and other participants in the Congo Reform Association, which uh, launched uh, a vast international campaign against uh, uh, Leopold's Congo in 1904. And as a result, um, uh, popular histories uh, uh, focused on the work of the Congo Reform Association, like Adam or Child, best-selling King Leopold's Ghost, have also tended to uh, downplay uh, the importance of sexual violence as uh, 
uh, one of the, um, um, the, the realities of um, the Congo Free State regime of oppression. Similarly, uh, in the aftermath of Ludo de Witt's uh, 1999 um, um, book, then translated in 2001 in English, uh, The Assassination of Lumumba, in the aftermath of the uh, Parliamentary Commission that uh, uh, followed in Belgium uh, the publication of de Witt's book, the mechanism that led to the political and physical elimination of Patrice Lumumba became much you know, better known, including the, the role of, um, of Belgium, but also the, uh, of the United States. Yet um, in this debate, little attention was being paid to the broader impact of the catastrophic uh, Belgian decolonization in the Congo beyond the assassination itself. By contrast, in June of last year, a group of five mixed race women began a legal action against the Belgian state for crime against humanity. The women were born in the Congo in the 1940s, accused the Belgian state of having forcefully separated them from their parents when they were children, and of having subsequently abandoned them by the time of independence, leaving them prey to sexual abuses and rapes at the end of Congolese soldiers during the mutiny that directly followed the transition of power in the summer of 1960 in the Congo. One possible takeaway from the current parliamentary commission, um, which is happening in Belgium, um, uh, could be to give a platform to voices and histories that have been silenced or ignored so far, like the history of this uh, group of women. At the same time, it's likely that the commission will also have to revisit the episodes of Leopold's Red Rubber and of Lumumba's assassination, if only because a full reckoning with the violence of the free state period is still in order, as the attacks against Leopold statues and monuments of the past year powerfully reminded us, and because Belgian authorities did not follow up on the promises for reconciliation and reparation that they made um, at the time of the Lumumba Commission in 2001. Furthermore, and this is probably the main point that I want to uh, make uh, here, I also believe it's crucial for um, Belgium to reckon with the world historical significance, if I can use this term, the world historical significance of its colonial occupation of Central Africa, which more dramatically manifested itself around the moments of red rubber and uh, the Congo crisis. As is well known the Congo only became a colony of Belgium in 1908, while the Belgian mandate on Burundi and Rwanda was only officially established in 1922. The initial colonial conquests of the Congo Basin at the end of the 19th century was personally orchestrated by Leopold II, the King of Belgium. And while Leopold turned to the Belgian state for diplomatic and financial support at several points, he formally acted independently from the Belgian state using a private military force and the service of explorers who signed treaties with rulers across the Congo River Basin, the king claimed control of a gigantic territory that brought together a, a diversity of pre-existing polities and various commercial networks oriented towards the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean and the Nile River Valley. A colony without a metropole recognized as an independent state by Western powers at the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, Leopold's Congo Free State, as it was known, emerged as a symbol of the era of new imperialism. Ruled by the king of a small neutral country, the Free State presented itself as an experiment in imperialist internationalism by combining liberal peace and authoritarian humanitarianism. The state initially announced that it would renounce uh, mercantilism and protectionism, and that it would instead open itself to missionaries and merchants from across the, the so-called civilized world, regardless of their nationalities. The Berlin Act imposed the principles of free trade and free navigation as pillars of the new colony, while Leopold profiled himself as a hero of the expansion of European civilization of the abolition of slavery and of the promotion of free labor in Central Africa. 
there was a huge gap between what Leopold in in associates uh, promise, promise at Berlin and other international conferences and the way that their exploitation of the Congo unfolded. The private colony became a vast battleground in war capitalism. European agents working directly for the king or for concessionary companies supervised a regime of permanent looting that terrorized local populations into submission and forced them to participate in the collection of rubber and ivory. These agents committed multiple massacres. Their regime of terror disrupted communities and ways of life in ways that led to dramatic rises in mortality, with many people dying of epidemics and malnutrition, and dramatic declines in fertility due to general uh, increased morbidity, but also to the, to the psychic trauma caused by colonial violence. It is difficult to know for sure what was the exact impact of the Leopoldian regime on the Congolese population. In a recent edited volume, uh, edited by, uh, uh, it is by Goderis, Amandine Noro, and Given Temch, the demographer Jean-Paul Sanderson synthesized attempts at reconstructing Congolese historical demography. In this article, Sanderson estimates that the size of the population in the Congo was around 10 million people in, in the early 1930s, whereas it would have been between 11 and 15 million by the time of the establishment of the Congo Free State 50 years uh, earlier in the middle uh, 1880s. The human costs and destruction of lives uh, um, that the um, uh, uh, colonial um, regime under Leopold entailed are one of the most direct expression of the cognitive dissonance of, of uh, the Congo Free State between on the one hand a commitment to liberal imperialism and on the other hand the pra a practice of uh, making this exploitation. This dissonance, in turn, explain why Edmund Morel and his allies were able to build such a powerful international movement against Leopold. Morel and other human rights activists did not criticize colonial exploitation as such, but the fact that Leopold had renounced uh, to the, pr the principles of free trade and free labor, which they viewed as the necessary condition for the integration of Africans into Eurocentric world order. Yet, the failure of the free state can be seen as a symbol for the failure of the broader imperialist world making project to borrow a term recently used by Adam Getachew. This exemplary status of the Congo free state in the history of imperialism and globalization is important to keep in mind in the present discussion. The fact that the Congo had served as a laboratory for the establishment of a world order cementing the domination of Europe over its others continued to reverberate in the mind of many anti-imperialist thinkers throughout the 20th century. The Congo was indeed a central reference to many figures who, unlike Morel, did not believe in reforming global imperialism, but instead uh, sought its full demise. From W.E.B. Du Bois to M.S. Césaire, Franz Fanon, Kwame Nkrumah, or Malcolm X. Patrice Lumumba was also one of these figures. As a political leader, he looked at decolonization as a world historical phenomenon as well a world historical phenomenon that would alter the system of inequality systematized at the Berlin Conference. On June 30, 1960, on the day of the Congo's independence, Lumumba gave his most powerful speech ever, a radical denunciation of the ills of colonialism and a call for a Congo freed from all oppressions. The speech did not address the period of the Congo Free State specifically, but Lumumba talked of wounds inflicted upon the Congolese during the 80 years of colonial rule. He presented independence as the end um, to continued suffering that had begun uh, with Leopold. But Lumumba also mentioned that by accepting to recognize the Congo's independence, Belgium had finally learned the lesson of history. Lumumba was proven wrong on this last point. His assassination six months later proved that the Belgian political establishment actually refused to accept the lesson of history. It was clear already when Lumuma made his speech, as he was responding to an absolutely tone deaf declaration by the King of Belgium, Baudouin, who talked of his great grand uncle, Leopold, as a pioneer of African emancipation, who had appeared as a civilizer in front of the Congolese and paved the way to the country's independence. In 1960, 
and the years that followed, Belgian words and actions articulated a vision of his relation with the Congo that in many ways can be characterized as neo-colonial and that refused to accept the demands of equality and dignity beyond the project of anti-colonial world making. Today, the global stakes of the Congo colonial, the, uh, uh, the colonial occupation and decolonization of the Congo are not necessarily always present in Belgian discussions of colonialism. Instead, there are often attempts to present colonialism as both an incidental and accidental appendix to the national past, which the country could come to terms with by simply laying out the facts and opening up the archives. This process has been important in the self-reinvention of Belgium in the post-Cold War period, yet a true reconciliation clearly calls for radical transformation that may go beyond public recognition of wrongdoings in the past. And this is why it's crucial to have in mind the centrality of the Congo and its colonial occupation in the making of a Eurocentric world order that may not be fully passed. Thank you so much, um, Pedro, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation, which was also a perfect balance between historiography, history, historical truth, and the current debates and challenges of uh, reparation and reconciliation. And obviously, if uh, we are talking about right to truth um, of, in a historically distant case, the role of historians uh, in this process is un undeniable. Um, so thank you for um, showing us that. Uh, so our, uh, I will uh, introduce our next two speakers uh, together because they coordinated um, their uh, talks. Amaido uh, is the Homer Bernal Assistant Professor of Anthropology and African Studies at MIT. She's an anthropologist interested in the production of knowledge about Africa. The questions her work engages uh, are informed in important ways by her lived experience uh, in the US, Europe, and West and Southern Africa as a dual uh, Togolese and American citizen. Ido's current uh, book project, Our Grandmother's Clothes, Materiality, Class, and Global Membership in the Age of the New Africa, traces uh, the trajectory of Dutch wax clothes between Holland uh, and Togo. Ido completed a PhD in MIT's program in History, Anthropology, and Science, Technology, and Society in 2016. She was a postdoctoral associate in Francophone African Studies uh, in MIT's Global Studies and Languages program. Prior to joining the academy, she was in the field of public health for six years and obtained an MSc in pop uh, Population and International Health uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health. She conducted research on community-based responses to the HIV AIDS pandemic as a Fulbright Scholar to Zambia and helped to develop health literacy interventions for vulnerable South African youth and veterans affairs hospitals in the US. And our next speaker uh, will be Lilian Mobieyi, who holds a PhD uh, in social sciences from the Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, de Kasha uh, and in law from the Université saint louis Brussels in Belgium. Her dissertation examined South African apartheid victims mobilization through the South African and US judicial systems to challenge the limits of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Umubieye also conducted research on community mechanisms of conflict resolution in the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo as a consultant for the United Nations Development Program and the International Center for Transitional Justice. Prior to joining Avocat Saint Frontier as a research coordinator in 2018, she taught uh, sociology at Sciences Po Paris and, and political uh, science at University of Paris. Um, along, the, along with uh, Professor Amaido, uh, she's co-project lead for the Avocat Saint Frontier. Uh, their project is called Taking Action on the Colonial Past and Its Legacies. I'm very much looking forward to your joint presentation. 
thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting us and, uh, and also for giving us the opportunity to, uh, uh, to present our perspectives on this commission, but also the project that we've been uh, working on with, uh, with uh, AMA since um, last summer. Um, I would like to, uh, to describe very briefly how the, this commission um, arose, but also um, the, the mandate of the commission and, uh, and how, how have been this, uh, our involvement in the process. So our, um, as we all know, uh, the death of George Floyd in, 20, in May 2020 uh, sparked a global movement against uh, racial injustice. And uh, in Europe, uh, um, in former European uh, uh, powers like France, uh, France, Belgium, UK, and Germany, there have been uh, demands from deep, from uh, from activists to uh, to counter the prejudices suffered by racial racialized populations, but also uh, demands related to uh, to colonial past. And this, uh, these demands in Belgium have uh, taken uh, different forms. As uh, there, are, there were, of course, uh, different protests against uh, uh, police brutality. There were also um, actions against uh, statues uh, of Leopold II. Uh, these statues were, uh, as you, are, you have seen in the, in the news, they have been uh, covered in red, they have, um, they have been tagged. But also, as uh, Pedro was meant, uh, was uh, was saying before, there was this legal action that was um, that that has been launched against the uh, against the Belgian states, uh, the Belgian state, sorry, for crimes against humanity, uh, for the removal of um, of uh, children from their Congolese families. Uh, 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 there was this action in, in, in June. And later on, um, uh, the King of Belgium expressed his regrets uh, for the serious acts committed by Belgium uh, during uh, colonialism. So there have been all these, uh, these different events. And um, the, uh, in July, 2020, the uh, Belgium, uh, Belgian Federal Parliament decided to set up a special commission that will be in charge of examining uh, the Congo Free State and uh, Belgium's colonial past in DRC, uh, Rwanda, and Burundi. So, contrary to what we may think, uh, this wasn't a, a spontaneous act from uh, from the from the state. In fact, it was um, this um, the setup of this commission results from a demand has been uh, expressed by uh, uh, various movements, but also. Uh, by the Green Party, going back to um, um, that goes back to uh, 2016, and um, the UN Working Group in uh, 2019 expressed uh, in its recommendation the necessity to set up a Truth Commission. And for the last 15 years in Belgium, there were different um, uh, there were different uh, there have been different movements and organizations that ha that have been denouncing this uh, uh, the the that have been that have been denouncing the the legacy of col of uh, Belgium's uh, Belgian past colonial past and the, its current consequences on the on uh, people of African descent. And this organization uh, uh, include uh, we can in, in among this organization we have like um, Memoire Colonial, Bamco, uh, Decolonize Belgium, uh, Hand in Hand uh, Against Racism. So there have been many movements that have been uh, that have been uh, involved in this debate in denouncing this uh, uh, this colonial past uh, for many years. There have, um, there have been, uh, these movements have uh, taken different actions. So for example, there was, um, there has been a legal action again, the, against the Royal Museum for Central African um, uh, for uh, theft of uh, artifacts. But there were also different actions uh, uh, denouncing the presence of Leopold II in the public space. Um, and there were, also different um, different actions uh, denouncing some part of tradition Belgian traditions that are that keep stigmatizing uh, black populations 
And it's only uh, it's only uh, in July 2020 that the, Belge the the Parliament decided to set up this commission. So what is it, what exactly is uh, is this commission? It's um, as you have said in your introduction, Ezra. The, this commission is a parliamentary commissions commission. It means that um, its members are deputies and they represent uh, different political parties, ranging from far uh, far left to far right. And Although this commission uh, has not been qualified as a truth and reconciliation commission, when we look at its mandate, uh, it is very clear that the, the, the transitional justice framework and vocabulary is, uh, is used. For instance, uh, in terms of uh, truth seeking, um, the mandate uh, says that the commission is in charge, I quote, of shedding the light on the Congo Free State and Belgium's colonial past in DRC, Burundi, and Rwanda. The commission is also in charge of examining, examining the structural role of the Belgian state and of non-private actors, such as religious institution, institutions, the monarchy, and the private companies in Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. It is also in charge of examining the economic impact of colonialism on Belgium and and on colon, colonized territories, end of quote. In regard to reconciliation, uh, the mandate of the commission says that um, the commission will have to formulate proposals for reconciliation among Belgians, Belgians including those of Congolese, Rwandan and Burundian uh, descent but also optimizing relation, relations between Belgians, Congolese, uh, Rwandans, and Burundians. Um, as far as the reparation, uh, reparations uh, are, concer are concerned, the text does not explicitly use the word reparations. However, there are multiple elements that, um, that could that, um, lead uh, to think that it's, uh, it's a kind of reparation that is envisioned. So it says that the commission will have to ident identify symbolic actions such as the withdrawal of statues, public acknowledgement of facts, and the construction of monuments, which can have a soothing effect. The commission will also have to examine concrete actions such as the restitution of artifacts, financial support to public initiatives, international cooperation, cooperation in foreign policies, which can have an impact on the behavior of the population in regard to racism and xenophobia. Last but not least, the same text says that the commission is in charge of examining the extent to which victims can be associated to this work and the legal and financial consequences. So even if the term, the term reparations is not used as such, I think these different uh, elements uh, lead us to think that the, 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 the idea is there. So far, the work of the, uh, the, work of the commission uh, hasn't started yet. At the moment, there is only a group of experts, of experts, of 10 experts that are working to, uh, to prepare a roadmap regarding the activities and the methodology. Their report was supposed to be published uh, on the 1st of December last year, 2020, uh, but we're still waiting. For us, who are outside of the commission uh, and who are in, very interested by, this, uh, by these issues, uh, setting up such a mechanism represents uh, a, a historical opportunity. Um, as I think uh, Pablo de Graff was saying, it's it's uh, it's it's quite a it's quite a unique in the in the in the history of a, of a, not only transitional justice but reparation to uh, reparation to uh, um, to historical injustices, and that's why one part of our project. It's to document uh, the process, not only what the commission will be doing, but what all the 
all the debates and all the processes that is around this commission because we think it's it's a it's a historical moment that this um, that we are uh, this uh, commission is um, is opening. That being said, uh, the launching of the process has involved many challenge has involved challenges, which raised uh, many tensions and controversies in Belgium. First of all, uh, there was no consultation process before the establishment of the commission. Its setting up was abruptly announced uh, in the media and members' names uh, were leaked soon after. And as we know uh, from other transitional justice experiences, the uh, consultation processes are fundamental uh, to increase the understanding of truth commissions to have input uh, inputs from uh, communities and civil societies that are uh, that are concerned. Another important challenge of this uh, of this um, commission has been the the selection of the group of experts, the ten experts which are writing the uh, the roadmap. Uh, this process hasn't been transparent at all, and some of the figures uh, have been very uh, divisive and have caused um, outrage. And this, is, has, uh, this has been particularly the case for the Rwandan expert uh, who is a lawyer and who is, uh, who is uh, a member of an organization uh, which, has, um, which, which denies uh, the, the, the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda. So at this level, we, uh, in our uh, initiative, we've been urging the commission and advising uh, the different civil society uh, society organizations on the importance of some key principles in transitional justice uh, regarding the inclusion of uh, of, uh, or, uh, of communities and organizations affected by the pro uh, concerned by the process, but also the necessity of for transparency. Um, we are uh, we are aware of the strong uh, political dynamics that are that are at play inside and outside uh, of the of the commission, and um, and we know that this commission runs the risk the risk of overlooking some uh, fundamental uh, aspect or uh, issues related to the uh, memory of col uh, the uh, col uh, colonial past. Uh, related to uh, reconciliation and, and reparations. And but also we know that there is a risk that it's, um, it will uh, consume the energy and the resources of various stakeholders and especially all these uh, civil society organizations who, uh, who have been pushing for this deb debate to take place uh, in the last 15 years. Um, and this is the reason why we think that uh, uh, the um, it, it is important that actors that are uh, that there are, there needs to be actors outside of the commission uh, to put uh, pressure to make sure that uh, fundamental uh, points are not neglected are taken into consideration, and it's uh, it's essentially that that uh, um, I mean the. The, what we've been doing in, that, in, this, uh, in this project, but I, I will uh, let Ama continue and uh, maybe more uh, exp uh, explain some more on the, on the approach and the, and the dynamics. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lilian. And thank you, Esra, for the invitation. Um, this is a really, really nicely constructed panel. Um, and I think the different contributions bounce off of each other really nicely. Um, as Vivian mentioned, um, or, and as Esra mentioned in the introduction also, we've been working on this um, initiative collaboratively. So Vivian from Avocats Sans Frontières, and I, um, in my capacity as, um, as an academic. And so I think what I'd like to do is kind of tell you a little bit more about the nature of the project, um, but I'll come to it in a roundabout way because the way that we've structured this, um, this intervention and this collaboration is completely modeled on the realities and the nature of the movement that we are responding to or that we're trying to um, contribute to or support or intervene on. 
Um, I think one of the, the defining features of what's happening right now around the debate around reparations um, for or reparations or even just addressing the memory of the colonial and slave trading past of European nations is the fact that this is a situation that's unfolding across multiple realms. It's almost a, by definition, a trans movement, right? It's trans topic, um, it's trans um, discipline, it's trans um, national in its, in its constitution. Um, and what I mean by that is that, as was, has been mentioned already, I think it was Pablo de Grave, was that, you know, when we talk about restorative justice around these questions, we're talking not only about economic reparations, but we're also talking about the public space, the reimagining of the public space, right, with these the questions about statues, we're talking about the restoration of artifacts, we're talking about questions of racial justice from police violence to um, socioeconomic opportunities, um, we're talking about foreign policy, right, so there's a a number of topics that are coming into um, that are in that are in the mix right now, right? With a, and a range of um, disciplinary areas. Um, in addition, a number of the actors, be it in Belgium or other European countries or African countries that matter that are involved in these debates, wear multiple hats, right? Are activists and also scholars, um, and and refuse to be limited to either to either frame, and in fact, each side of their practice informs the other side, right? And this is a constitutive aspect of how they come into the, the, the situation. Um, and then there's kind of, there's, there's the national bounds of, or transnational um, kind of mappings of the way this is unfolding. And so Pedro was mentioning um, the global stakes, the fact that the global stakes of colonization of Belgium's colonization of Congo have been under um, appreciated. Similarly, I think the global stakes of um, the current moment, right? Whether we think about, when we think about the, um, the commission in Belgium right now and what it builds on and what it's potentially opening up, the global stakes of that are also um, significant. And I think, and this is part of um, what informs, an important part of what informs the approach that, that we've been taking. Um, and so I guess my main point that I wanna come back to is that the, the fact that this, the, this moment is unfolding across fields, right? That it's, it's characterized by a decompartmentalization if you wanna think about it that way. Um, and decompartmentalization and compartmentalization um, I, I would argue, are political strategies in this moment that um, we need to kind of take, take seriously and engage seriously. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, for instance, if we think about the range of, um, of topics, I already mentioned the range of topics that come up in restorative justice, right? When we think about the forms of academic expertise that might be relevant that might, to informing the response to um, to these calls for reparations, it expands the fields between what is already, as Pablo was mentioning, a multidisciplinary field, right, of transitional justice, to the realms of art history, of ur to urban studies, to um, economists, right, to um, museum scholars. It, it just expands the range of academic fields that, um, of expertise that are relevant to this. Um, and so beyond an academia, then there's a, the, 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 the need for, um, greater exchanges, right, between, or a brokering of knowledge, let's say, between academics, um, activists, and policymakers. And the commission really creates the situation, well, creates, yeah, it sort of forced um, this moment where, um, because as Jan was mentioning, the, um, in the Belgian case in particular, you have activists who've been involved in these questions around um, anti-racism um, in Belgium for over 15 years, but now the, the kind of the transitional justice frame that the commission hints at or gestures towards, even if it's not formally a TJ um, mechanism, forces a reframing of the question, right? So that even though these activists have been on the ground, have been fighting these battles for 15 years, there needs to be a different way of entering the discourse, a different set of technical tools that need to be leveraged in order to be able to um, engage in the, the this new mechanism that's being made available. And so that, and that's where an organization like Avocat Sans Frontier with its technical um, sort of expertise in this arena of transitional justice can play, um, can play a role in, in facilitating exchanges um, between um, the, these kind of these institutional, this new apparatus 
and activists while bringing in academics from these range of, um, of areas who have relevant expertise to support the activists in making their cases. Um, I think what's really interesting to look at is the ways that in thinking about this trans dimension of the movement is looking at the its geographical mappings, because I think that is actually a fundamental aspect of this question. And it's sort of forcing us, I think, to expand our frame. You know, the event today is talking about Belgium, Congo, Belgium to Congo. Um, and I think um, we would push, you know, and, and kind of expand that frame and say precisely this, this question of the Belgium Congo is actually, there is, um, how would I put it? There is a stake in making that actually in broadening that frame. Um, and to kind of get there, if we just retrace the steps of the events that have led us there, right? So as Idian mentioned or reminded us, you have the killing of George Floyd um, in Minneapolis on May 25th. Um, and then in the next couple of weeks, you have uprisings throughout the US, right? Um, and not just across the US, across 1,000 cities in the US, but then in 60 countries around the world. And in fact, you know, for me, for, based in the US as I am, it was when I saw the, the repercussions, the ways that what was happening in Minneapolis or what had happened in Minneapolis had echoed um, across the world is that I realized that there was something different happening with this particular, um, these particular BLM marches compared to all those that had been um, happening since 2013. And what you see in um, the European BLM marches in particular was that they were, you know, participants flew the banners of BLM um, in solidarity with what was happening in the US, but always also drawing attention to the situations in specific countries, right? So in France, in particular, for the Justice, for, uh, Justice uh, Pour Adama movement, right? Um, in Belgium, also about police violence and also about the, the Leopold um, II statues. In Bristol, you had the Edward Colston statues. So each time in the European context, it was this moment of asserting um, and expressing solidarity with the American movement and saying, and making a direct connection to what was happening to realities in these European contexts, which pointed to the colonial and slave, um, slave pasts, right? Um, and that, is no, that is no accident because it's a kind of a recasting of the question um, that is made all the more, or sort of the political strategy of it is all the more evident when we look at the state reaction to, um, to these efforts. In particular, I'm sure many of you have seen the, um, there was a New York Times article a couple of, I don't know these days, maybe last week, a couple of weeks ago, about the French, um, kind of the French reaction to a perceived threat coming from the American left. So the threat to uh, French institutions of higher education coming from all these, this discourse about decolonization, about race, um, about gender, right? Um, and part of the, the, the drive or the impetus or kind of what that argument builds on is the idea that these concepts, this concept of race, notably, um, these are concepts that are being imported from without, right? That these are not, this is not a French problem. This is an American concept that's being brought to bear on French questions. So the casting of the question as, are we dealing here with, um, with a global, anti-racist movement that is a product of historical forces that take specific shapes in different places? Or are we dealing with a, you know, a specifically Franco-French problem about social inequity and you know, questions of um, religious freedom and, and secularity? Are we dealing with global racism or are we dealing with, in the case of the Netherlands, cultural traditions? And you know, if we think about Sartre Piet, um, are we dealing with Dutch traditions and cultural heritage? Um, in the case of, of Belgium, you know, is this global, is this again, is this global racism or is it about a specific colonial history between Belgium and the Congo or Belgium and Rwanda and Burundi? And so there's a, there's, it's no accident. And, and to add to this, um, the, my discussion of the French case, the fact that there is a targeting of um, universities, right, and of specific scholars in universities as the, the conveyors maybe of this, um, this pollution coming from, from uh, the US, right, as people who are um, more activists and they're academics. The, the framing of these individuals in that, in that way is as much a strategy, a political strategy, as the fact that the BLM activists framed their, their, um, their efforts, or not just the BLM activists, activists who rose up um, 
post um, George Floyd's killing in, in Europe, the fact that they framed their situation in a BLM frame. Right. So the, the, the ways that this, this issue about how should European countries deal with their colonial and slave pasts um, and its consequences in this moment, the way the extent to which that issue is compartmentalized into a national issue, um, an activist issue versus an intellectual issue, an academic issue, um, all of those things are part of the, those are the, those decisions about compartmentalizing and decompartmentalizing are fundamentally political and political to the extent that um, they are all leveraged towards a particular um, aim. And so this, um, this informs, this has come to inform the form that um, our work has taken in a very organic way. Um, the, the, the tackle initiative was, um, came from, from Lilian at ISF um, if with coming from uh, you know, this, her training in, in sociology of law and transitional justice. Um, but the idea was we need to you know, follow the action, follow what's happening and, and bring to bear the technical expertise that, that ISF has on these questions, but then also create linkages across these different arenas. Um, and so just by following the action necessarily, you're working across the, the various fields of academic practice, you're working among academics, activists, and policymakers, and you're working across borders because the issue is, is, is playing out across borders. Um, and so we are building, we've been building this up at the Belgian scale by virtue of the events, um, this commission that is in place. And, and as Ivian mentioned, um, the activities there around documenting the process and then um, facilitating um, um, interactions or exchanges across these different arenas. Um, but then we are the, we are building this out from the Belgian case to create connections across um, other European locations, and um, the the most immediate step in that is this um, this conference that we are organizing. Um, I guess it's happening in three weeks or so, three weeks a month. Um, that is meant to do exactly that, to highlight the efforts that are happening in France, in the UK, in Belgium, in Germany, um, around these questions of dealing with the colonial past and with reparations, um, recognizing that the form that it's taking in every place is specific to the, you know, the, the, um, the questions uh, and the histories of those countries, but that there, in many cases, there are already linkages in place, and where there are not, there may be an advantage or benefits to be gleaned from um, having from creating linkages among them. Um, and so that is the sort of by following kind of the, pro the progression of events until now. Um, there's a natural orientation towards crossing, going across borders in, um, in supporting these efforts, which if you think about, you know, why are we involved in this? You know, it's funny, you know, Belgium, Congo, at least um, Lilian is Belgian based, is Belgian and, uh, um, and works in, at ISF. Um, I'm Togolese, an American and an anthropologist based in the US. But this is exactly what this, these questions of reparations and um, dealing with Europe's colonial past bring up is the fact that they, they are as relevant to someone who's a transitional justice focus as to an anthropologist who's interested about African being in the world and the question of Africa in the world. And um, both of us, by virtue of not just our personal profiles and our um, educational training, but also institutional groundings, um, are coming to this with different but um, um, complementary sets of interests. Um, and so the goal of this initiative is by no means to stand for the activists who are doing the work on the ground by no means at all, um, but rather to kind of to create these, these bridges across these, er these different areas of practice, these different academic disciplines, and these national boundaries um, in a way that we think our institutional grounding, as well as our geographic um, locations, um, make possible. So um, hopefully that gives you a little idea of what um, this tackle initiative has been um, and um, allows us to make connections um, to, to some of the other, um, the other presentations about what it means to bring transitional justice um, mechanisms to bear on the, the current situation. But I will stop there and I look forward to chatting with you all. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for um, these um, 
lovely uh, presentations, uh, very informative and a lot of food for thought and also questions. Uh, I was wondering if Lilian, you would like to conclude uh, because uh, you said you may talk about the approaches and dynamics uh, if uh, there's interest. Uh, if you would like to say a few words to conclude your presentation, please go ahead. I think we do have time. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think uh, Anna said um, um, the core of our, of our of our project and um, and the core principle, which is to try to um, um, to uh, to, uh, to to bridge this uh, this different type of expertise, this, this different types of uh, practices, um, and. Uh, and because we think that, uh, in terms of, uh, as she said, it's a, it's a kind of uh, political strategies to uh, uh, to separate um, whether institutional uh, uh, the academic and uh, um, and activists, whether it is nationally to say it's not it's not a, a global question, it's it's a national question, um, and uh, whether it's uh, by saying that um, uh, the the uh, it's um, uh, it's it, it is this type of discipline and not the other. So this, I think, the the the, the core idea is that of what we're trying to do is really to uh, uh, to bridge all these type of uh, uh, practices and uh, and um, uh, practices and uh, and disciplines in order to uh, to to leverage um, the the kind of uh, pressure. That we can uh, that we can uh, we can put on on the process in order for the process to uh, to to uh, uh, to follow some principles in tr uh, to transitional justice principles whether it's the inclusion of uh, uh, the inclusion of uh, of uh, communities and organization concerned by these questions um, whether it's uh, it is in terms of uh, transparency so we are um, but. I think yeah the 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 core idea ha has been said so but I, I'm ready to uh, to uh, dig deeper yeah, after. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So maybe I can uh, start by asking whether the panelists have um, comments or questions to each other. Uh, on that front, maybe I may uh, ask Pablo, for instance, what do you think are uh, the colonialism reparation mechanisms other than uh, the mechanisms that have already been produced in transitional justice literature for transitioning from military regimes and so on. What do you think uh, are other ways? Or so, uh, I think can you that, think of any other ways? Yeah. So I think that uh, Anna gave a wonderful uh, list, uh, and I'm sure it's uh, not a complete uh, list of uh, initiatives that both uh, Lilian and Am and their project are working on, but uh, others as well. Uh, so um, some of them uh, that have uh, uh, very deep uh, symbolic importance, the restoration of uh, cultural objects, I think is uh, an issue. But of course, others that uh, are more structural and that have uh, a lot to do with uh, ongoing situation changes in foreign policy, changes in some dimensions of internal policy, including, for example, policing strategies. I think it's a, a very, very important issue. A different initiatives uh, towards uh, social uh, integration and the integration of um, a multicultural society that includes uh, uh, populations from uh, former colonial states uh, that involve a particular set of dynamics that it would be senseless to ignore as if it was uh, the effort to integrate uh, just any other sort of uh, migrant community. No, the, the, you carry some particular load and baggage when you are coming from a former colony. Uh, so I think that the, this is one of the exciting things about uh, this project, I think, that uh, it invites a broadening of the tools that are applied to the objective of achieving a certain form of redress 
achieving a certain form of prevention and achieving a certain form of uh, reconciliation. The typical transitional justice model will fall short. The general lessons and the objectives or that underlie the transitional justice model will be very useful. But I think that uh, one of the great opportunities that initiatives of this sort uh, present is precisely a diversification of tools and a return to the fundamentals. The, when I was criticizing uh, some late trends in transitional justice as being too formalistic and expressions of uh, mimicry of isomorphic uh, mimicry. I think uh, that uh, this is something that one has uh, to worry about and that the best way to respond to them is through practice in reality. And uh, I, of course, want to give uh, a great deal of credit to the project that has been mentioned. And without, uh, I reiterate, without knowing the details of the commission and the initiative, and now having learned that it was preceded as these things usually are by a great deal of, social, of civil society mobilization, often by legal action. There's nothing new in this year. I don't know any government that comes to this in a totally spontaneous way. I want to do the right thing. No, governments are brought to do this sort of thing. Uh, but I also want to give some credit to the fact that it has taken place and that the commission is appointed and then the task is but I was very fond of telling uh, uh, both government officials and civil society activists in the countries where I worked to government, of, uh, government officials use this opportunity as if it were the last one to do justice to victims. And to civil society activists never think that this is the last opportunity because it is always a process and usually a long one. And I think that uh, if uh, that balance is achieved, then windows of opportunity for doing things that individually may not be a silver bullet, none of them uh, will be, but collectively will create uh, a sort of uh, path dependence and a trajectory towards a better understanding of the past, a better articulation of current policy, and an increase in well-grounded trust between communities, in this case, uh, across national borders. I think that uh, these are important opportunities to take advantage of. Thank you very much. Uh, any of the other panelists would like to respond to uh, each other or what has just been said? Uh, Pedro? I, yeah, uh, thanks a lot, everybody. I, I actually, I was just, um, I wanted to uh, put something on the table and maybe more for uh, Aman and Lilian. Uh, but I, uh, about, yeah, about what's happening right now with the, the Parliamentary Commission and uh, which I've been following from a distance, and uh, I really like the Amas vocabulary of uh, decompartmentalizing. And I guess, as a, as a scholar, I'd like to <laughs> decompartmentalize my, my work as well more. But it's different, difficult with time difference sometimes, and like you know, just physical distance of uh, of being kind of uh, connected to um, to the energies, I guess, uh, um, around. Uh, sometimes against the commission, around the commission. Um, but I mean, something to me that's, I guess, that's striking um, is, uh, well, I guess the different kind of mechanism that led to to the commission in this case, so Lillian and Emma talked about them, but uh, in comparison to like previous moments, similar kind of you know, uh, uh, the discussions of the colonial past, so the, for instance, the 2001 uh, Lumumba commission that I kind of um, I mentioned in my, my comments, but uh, I guess here there is a clear attempt at 
um, well, you know, I, I think at, um, uh, at a certain kind of accountability uh, to um, um, to a different type of you know uh, Belgian citizenry, including of post-colonial subjects, so uh, people who are you know uh, uh, um, originating from Africa, um, and which was which was not the case. I I, I mean uh, so much um, as at least I would say. Uh, Earlier, I think that's this is kind of a, this is a more recent um, uh, development. Uh, partly because I think the activism of uh, Black Belgians uh, has also grew, you know, uh, over the past uh, two decades, and I think that's kind of a reflection of that. Um, so, and I know there's there have been some frustrations, and um, uh, and I think from. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, some of the associations that or, um, Leon mentioned uh, have been quite critical of the, uh, the the commission, or as also Lillian talked about uh, the controversies around the selection of the the, the experts for uh, uh, well, they are supposed to to build this roadmap for the commission. Uh, but at least there is engagement, and it's, there is a sense that uh, from the political establishment, you know, there is there is a willingness to engage with this community, and much less. Uh, it's less, much less clear to me uh, what is the engagement with uh, um, people based on the African continent uh, in, in Congo, Burundi, and Rwanda. I know that some experts, and the, the, there was an expert from, from Burundi, uh, based in Burundi, but I, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I, who, who passed away, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, recently, but I. So what? So yeah, I just wanted to ask, ask them, you know, what what do they think about the attempts that have been made or or maybe not made to reach out to uh, actors on uh, in Africa, uh, in Central Africa, and also maybe like is there like possibilities to try to engage people uh, outside of state structures, uh, you know, uh, because it's also um, I think a sort of it can be a problematic. Uh, issue, uh, I think, uh, this kind of state to state debate about the colonial past, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, it's, it's it's not been very productive, I guess, always. Um, and so, uh, yes, I'm wondering what the commission is doing, and uh, and and maybe like how also through the, the what's what's kind of um, uh, how your project is engaging with that. Uh, so. Uh, these um, uh, conversations across borders, but also like across uh, continents. Amma, I can start, and uh, if you don't mind, um, thank you for uh, for your question, um, which is uh, effectively very. It's an important aspect of this um, uh, of this process. And um, one remark that I would I would like to uh, uh, to make before I answer to your question, uh, indeed, it's not the first time that this debate is in, is in social, institutionalized. Uh, there was the first uh, the, the first attempt with the Lumumba Commission, even though, even though it was different. It is um, uh, um, it's, it, it it reminds us this is we can't uh, we can't just say oh it's a victory this debate uh, arrived in the in the parliamentary. There have been other commissions, and the results were uh, I mean we we uh, we have to be uh, very um, cautious. Uh, about what this type of commission can uh, can uh, can bring. Um, as far as the question of uh, the the um, uh, the the initiatives outside of uh, outside of Belgium, um, the, the the discussion that we uh, we uh, we have been uh, we had up to now with the with the com with the commission is that. They are starting to uh, um, to uh, to prepare some type of uh, uh, of uh, discussion or uh, approaches with population and with organizations in the different countries, but that uh, that aspect hasn't started yet. But we know from uh, um, from two contexts, uh, Rwanda and uh, and and uh, in DRC, there were two um, two elements that uh, that um, that I can mention. 
which uh, which um, which are linked to this uh, to this commission. It's first of all when this expert, the Rwandan expert, has um, has been selected as a member of the commission. The Rwandan Parliament decided to uh, to write a letter uh, to the Belgian state, reacting to the fact that it's not uh, acceptable that someone who is a member of an organization denying uh, the Tutsi genocide uh, be a member of uh, of this commission. Um, I mean, uh, I, pre I mean, it hasn't uh, didn't change anything since uh, uh, the person is still an expert. And the second. Uh, uh, the second element um, that we uh, that is related to, uh, to this uh, 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 relations or discussion among like the different countries is um, in DRC. There is a group of people who, at the moment, is trying to uh, to, uh, to imagine or to develop a transitional process in uh, in uh, there, and they know that they are interested to to bring into conversation the, uh, the, the impact of colonialism on the, the actual the contemporary conflicts in DRC. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the member of this, uh, of this group uh, was a professor at the University of Kinshasa, uh, Luc Mutoy Mobiala. He's, um, he has, uh, he has uh, has been writing on this topic, and he's also who would uh, uh, intervene in our, in our conference. But there are discussions there. Or at least some people uh, are thinking about the fact of uh, making making links between the transitional justice process as it is happening in DRC within the uh, within the um, uh, within uh, within the colonial context, and they would like to get involved into the commission. But, and uh, we have also been, we have been in, in contact with um, an association of, uh, of, uh, uh, of um, this uh, Bayrasha, like children who have been abandoned by the, uh, um, and they're trying, I mean, what they, uh, they've, they share with us, they've been trying to, uh, to get into contact with the commission and to contact uh, the um, um, the Belgian embassy, uh, but in vain. So uh, it's very punctual initiatives in these different uh, countries, but some people here there have in, an interest. But so far, uh, at this what is happening in Belgium, I think the the, the debate and the controversies are still like uh, everything is in is uh, it's uh, still like a. It's um, being in construction. It's at a, It's in progress. So maybe the next step will be to uh, to approach uh, some organizations or population. I don't know, but uh, it's something that I have uh, that the members of the commission uh, uh, keep in mind. Yeah, and maybe I would add very quickly um, that. I mean, an absolute yes to everything you said, Pedro. And I think um, in particular, this question of how to involve actors outside of state bodies is, is the perennial challenge, you know, like how, because even in, in the examples that Ian mentioned, um, there's, it's the, the, there's an easier kind of access of points of interaction from state to state. But then once you try to step out of that, um, it opens both finding and then connecting these efforts to, um, to what's, on, what's going on is a challenge. I think what's interesting looking at um, and considering you know, to what extent you pull in efforts that are happening in the African countries is understand they were is paying attention to the starting point for the, the, the claims, right? So the claims that are being brought within the context of BLM. We're starting from questions of social, um, the social fabric or social integration um, and racism in the European con countries, right? And so the, 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 those folks being the, the, the black people um, or, or black or let's say Afro-descended people kind of raising these issues being Belgian people who are um, Afro-descended and so who are coming at it from that question, which is different from the questions that Africa-based um, activists might be bringing about the colonial past, right? So even though the two meet in the same um, movements, the they're, they're starting with different questions and effectively they're you know, there, there's separate struggles. And part of this initiative of the, the goal or the vision of connecting um, across borders, exactly as you say, it's not just connecting 
across European borders, um, but are, yeah, across European nation states, but then also connecting to these other struggles. Um, but because the subject of it is somewhat different um, and the, the institutional um, configuration of it is also different, it's, um, it's a different form of um, kind of, um, um, I don't know, movement building or of, of building these, um, these networks, but absolutely essential. Thank you. So maybe we can, um, I can read some of the questions that have been posed in the Q&A uh, box by our attendees. Uh, one of the questions uh, is by Stefan Parmentier. Um, thanks a lot uh, for this very interesting debate. As a researcher on transitional justice and being based in uh, Belgium, I'm keen to know your thoughts on the following, wondering if you have some advice to avoid that the parliamentary commission is drifting away uh, in two issues. A, how can this parliamentary commission avoid being drawn into political fights? And B, how can it manage to execute such a huge mandate, two phases of colonialism, post-colonialism and current day problems? And obviously, in the history of transitional justice, as Pablo may also um, bring other examples, there are so many um, cases where uh, transitional justice is used as a whitewashing, window dressing device, and compensations are never <laughs> enough. So I guess the question is, how can those previous mistakes or possible um, whitewashing and so on can be avoided? So if I may, <laughs> a couple of words, and uh, uh, Stefan is a good friend and a real expert on transitional justice, so <laughs> I think that uh, he's not totally in the dark about this at all. Uh, uh, he would know some of the uh, obvious things. I mean, first, uh, I, to be honest, uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, Stefan would agree with me, I would not frame this uh, uh, exactly in terms of uh, avoiding politics altogether. There is a sense in which uh, the task is itself uh, incredibly political. There is uh, obviously a difference between politics uh, with a capital P in terms of uh, thinking about uh, solutions that are not uh, zero sum, uh, but uh, rather win-win and that concentrate on the promotion of uh, public and uh, common goods. Uh, and uh, that uh, is different from uh, partisan political fights uh, that have uh, wrecked uh, some uh, commissions, uh, as uh, we know. But one of the antidotes to this, and it connects uh, with uh, Pedro's question and with Amma's uh, response, I think uh, that uh, guaranteeing uh, that uh, the commission is not uh, completely hermetic uh, to outside uh, voices, but rather that uh, it institutionalizes communication with uh, different groups, allows commissions, in fact, uh, to mitigate uh, the partisan political uh, uh, pressures uh, that they are under, uh, perhaps uh, ironically, but uh, not unlike uh, the lessons that one learns uh, from the difference between uh, open parliamentary procedures, uh, for example, and parliamentary procedures that are completely dominated by a few mm, political hacks, uh, to be perfectly honest. So openness and transparency is important, not just for exposed legitimacy, but also for the legitimacy of the process, of the ongoing process. And it will allow the Commission to do its work much better. And with respect to the immense scope, which was the other part of Stefan's question, I think that this is one of the challenges of uh, implementing transitional justice tools for dealing with uh, historical injustices. And this is where there is an element of experimentation 
that is inherent to this exercise. So in the mandate of truth commissions, and I have written a lot about this, including in reports to the Human Rights Council, one of the trends that one observes in the development of mandates is the increased temporal scope of the investigations that truth commissions are uh, required uh, to do. Uh, the Kenyan Truth Commission, uh, of course, uh, received a mandate to investigate abuses of various, various kinds since independence. Uh, the Moroccan Truth Commission had uh, a 40 year mandate. So, I mean, the, the historical scope uh, is wider than that of the original uh, Truth uh, Commissions. And that raises particular challenges. In this case, it is compounded by the fact that uh, the events themselves are temporarily distant. It's not just uh, that the scope of investigation is broad, but that the events that are supposed to be elucidated are not uh, temporarily proximate. And that raises some challenges. Uh, it also, on the other hand, uh, raises some opportunities as well. We should not uh, forget uh, Germany never had uh, an official truth commission. I mean, uh, the Federal Republic to deal uh, with its own crimes. And nevertheless, uh, I would argue, and I think that uh, people would agree, that uh, German dealing with the past over the decades uh, has been uh, a successful reckoning of uh, its own past. Part of that work was done not by officially appointed uh, commissioners, but by historians. And therefore, the use of academic and non-academic work around events that took place in the long past is an additional resource for commissions that are dealing with historical injustices. And that's not available to commissions that are dealing with recent abuses. So the sources of information and of evidence are different, but I think that it is not to say that historical, that the investigation of historical injustices starts from scratch and that there is absolutely no material that they can work with. On the contrary, in most cases, there is a great deal of material. And finally, I think that the focus should also be slightly different, that with respect to historical injustices, the task is not so much to uncover the truth, but to socialize it, because uh, again, it's not so much ignorance uh, uh, from an epistemic standpoint, uh, that is the main problem that needs to be solved. It's rather how to integrate the knowledge that is narrowly localized, for example, amongst experts, how to socialize it more broadly through school curriculum, through different types of cultural integration. First, and the second, uh, focus uh, where I think uh, there is a slight uh, but significant difference is that I think it is very important for these commissions to concentrate also on practical uh, solutions, practical recommendations as a response to historical injustices. In many countries, just as in the case of uh, that we are discussing today, uh, there have been different reports, different commissions, even in the US, uh, there are plenty of uh, congressional reports about uh, a police violence and uh, different reports about uh, uh, problematic uh, re uh, racial relations. The question is not to write one more report. I think that this would be extraordinarily disappointing. The question is how to do something that is effective 
and that responds to the current needs much better than a simple report uh, could. So I think that this would be my initial uh, reaction uh, to Stefan's uh, questions. Anyone else who would like to take this question? Um, okay, well, go ahead, sorry. Pedro and then yes. uh, I mean, I. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I mean, th thank you very much, Pablo, for taking that question. And I, I kind of, I don't really have, I kind of really have the same kind of uh, uh, detailed and uh, um, uh, you know uh, uh, response to that. But I, I think it, it may be also interesting to think about the the failure of the the commission, and and I, I uh, and I think it, I mean, maybe there are ways in which the failure of the commission can be. Uh, uh, productive in itself, and I think I mean I, I mean personally I'm I mean I'm I'm hoping that there will be progress made, uh, that um, um, there are, you know kind of a positive positive outcomes from this commission, but also you know based on the Lumumba Commission or the kind of like similar uh, you know, uh, debates about the colonial past in Belgium, uh, we can we can maybe predict that. <laughs> Um, all the expectations uh, uh, um, uh, of you know some of the people who are part of the process here will not be met, and uh, but how how can that be like a productive uh, a failure? And I think I, I mean it seems to me that maybe the the politicization is not a bad thing with regard to that, uh, and uh, it's it's that you know kind of the so. Uh, I think the, the 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 commission can be also like a success if if yes if it allows for the emergence of uh, you know I guess new voices the politicization of 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 of, of uh, new actors uh, and also uh, you know open disagreements. Uh, I was actually uh, this morning I was teaching uh, uh, using uh, I don't know if anybody uh, any of you know this text but uh, Salad Saladin Ambar's uh, study of. Uh, Malcolm X speech, uh, Malcolm X speech at the Oxford, the Oxford Union in uh, 1964, and uh, um, and and it's somewhat it seems relevant to me. But uh, uh, this kind of push against, you know, the issue uh, with liberalism in the in the context of you know the the, the U.S. for instance. But the, there is there is I mean the Commission in Belgium is happening in a moment when you have these kind of uh, uh, very clear. You know, a conservative turn. You know, uh, uh, xenophobia, uh, uh, Islamophobia as being you know kind of like powerful uh, uh, political forces in Belgium and elsewhere. Um, so, so I, I think that's like I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can like neutralize that neutralize that in this debate, but uh, but maybe there is an opportunity to kind of. Uh, 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 well, you know, make some of the tensions more visible and 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 try to. Uh, uh, used the commission as a you know as a moment in a in a movement, I would say. So uh, I think uh, I, if the commission was a, a total success, I, I would actually kind of be surprised. But I, I think maybe if, you know if we if we consider it a success after it, I, it, it it's over, I think maybe we're we will have missed something. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to add um, just a couple a couple of elements on this uh, uh, fear of politicization and uh, fear that the, the mandate uh, is very large. I think even members of the commission, some members at least, are aware that it's, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the task is huge, that uh, members uh, among the, the members of the parliament of the, of the commission, uh, I think like four of them are members of extreme right uh, 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 parties. So there, there are a lot of obstacles for this commission to, uh, to, um, uh, to satisfy the, the um, everyone needs, uh, uh, whether it's community, I mean, uh, uh, the diasporas or the anti-racism organization. So there is this, um, there is the, uh, this, um, this, Political. I mean, they know the limits of this of this commission, and also that their mandate is very large. But at the same time, I think that um, while I was, uh, I mean, we were discussing with them, they were also aware that uh, 
what can what this commission can produce uh, outside in terms of debate, and that's what uh, maybe Pedro was saying. It's also important uh, the 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 debates that uh, that um, the way that it can gather. Uh, uh, I mean, different different publics audiences in universities in uh, uh, in uh, I mean associations, political uh, parties, and uh, beyond Belgium, what it can uh, bring. It's also um, it's also a step in this uh, long process. So I, I think it's um, uh, we we uh, it will be maybe too naive for us to think that everything is going to be resolved for this commission, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a step in a long process. Um, thank you. Uh, maybe I can uh, move uh, to the um, next question. And there are a couple of questions that uh, are uh, asking for comparative analysis I will leave that to the end and maybe I can read them all together. But before that, there's a question about the monuments debate by Victor Zagab, Zagabe. Um, so what is the current attitude uh, regarding monuments and restitution uh, within the commission or um, within the academics in, in the field? And I would actually um, suggest Victor to watch the repatriation of museum objects um, uh, panel that was organized as part of this uh, reparations debate, but we didn't have uh, an uh, art historian or an expert that knew uh, about what's going on about restitution and monuments debate uh, in Belgium. So I wonder if you are aware of um, any, um, yeah, how is the commission thinking of restitution of some of the looted artifacts during colonization or what is it thinking about the monuments? Uh, it's one of the questions that is on the agenda of the commission. And uh, I guess uh, the report from the experts uh, may give um, uh, some advice on how to address this question. Um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's on the agenda, so we are... Uh, uh, Hopefully, it would uh, it will be addressed. Uh, but beside this uh, national initiative, I know that the city of Brussels has uh, put in place another commission. Oh, no, it's more like an advisory group that is supposed to reflect on this on this uh, matter. Uh, and it's uh, the task of this uh, body is uh, much uh, more um, uh, focused on the on this issue and involves a different type of. Uh, um, of a practitioner and academics from different backgrounds. I mean, it doesn't have the same uh, the, the same limits as the, the special commission. Um, and uh, it's um, they 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 started their work uh, at the end of last year, I think. So it's also in progress. Um, thank you. And let me um, maybe yeah. because our time is almost. Uh, oh, sorry, Pedro. Did you have something to say? Oh no, I just wanted to add just one one word. But uh, the yes, I mean, the, the, there is also debates about renaming uh, streets and, uh, and 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 public uh, uh, like names of tunnels. I think in Brussels as well, for instance, uh, in in relation to that. But I I just wanted to mention also, in, I guess, in the kind of the long history of the debates about the repatriation of. Uh, art objects from Belgium to uh, the Congo. There is the, the work of Sarah Van Burden, who's a historian at the uh, Ohio um, State, uh, uh, and uh, was also a member of the of the, the. She's part of the panel of experts for the commission, but she's uh, she's she's written extensively about uh, kind of the long history of repatriation, which was kind of there was a momentum in the 1970s at the time of the um, Mobutu's presidency. And kind of attempts from Tervuren to actually engage with that, and then that kind of shut down. Uh, but it's also not like a new uh, kind of conversation, and a work talks to, talks to the history of that. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have um, very little time. So maybe as our last set of questions, I would like to combine a few questions that are about comparative and transnational dimension of this. And some of these questions are. 
I think written from the perspectives of seeing the risks of that and the other ones are written from the perspective of the necessity of uh, conjoining efforts actually. Uh, so um, a, a question from Sarah Tanberg, uh, she's mentioning that she's interested in the Germany reparations and I would definitely advise her to come to our next panel, which is about Germany to Germany reparations uh, in post-war, uh, post-colonial uh, and post-unification um, times. Uh, but she's asking, my question then is whether uh, or if so, how multiple histories and their needs for transitional justice projects might be conjoined? Uh, what, in other words, are the possibilities and or limitations of solidarity around transitional justice projects within a singular national context? Um, and another comparative question um, is bringing the issues maybe to this country uh, by Robert Pan. Uh, he asks, what populations in the US merit transitional justice uh, and why? Um, and yet another uh, comparative question, uh, maybe uh, more about the risks uh, of this is by Evelyn Waters. Um, what are some of the risks in uh, creating, seeing linkages between the US and Black Lives Matter movement and the decolonization discourse and efforts in Belgium and other uh, European countries. Um, and maybe I can uh, ask this last question from uh, maybe uh, from the uh, other end of the point. Emma, you also talked about uh, how uh, in France, for instance, the US post-colonial thinking is considered to be threatening, quote unquote, and blaming Islam or leftists and so on and so forth. So this is, some sort of a white backlash uh, in a way, I can uh, name it in that way. Uh, and one of the um, questions that students keep asking us or people who have been really living this debate about racial justice and uh, so on have been asking is that there's also a frustration that issues of racial justice and you know, decolonization, these are not new topics. Uh, but our diversity uh, initiatives in the universities and so on and so forth. But we keep uh, returning to the square one uh, when their institutionalization is concerned. And maybe there, there are uh, also cycles of white backlash. So what uh, in this moment uh, can be the strategies to stand strong uh, against these kinds of white backlashes? Maybe yet another question. I know there are too many questions out there, but whichever you would like to pick uh, would be fine uh, in our last, um, yeah, last 15 minutes or so, I think would be maximum. Who would like to go first? <laughs> May I volunteer Ama to do this? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, I was just giving you a thumbs up for going for going okay. first, Pablo. <laughs> Whatever you prefer, Ama. So, uh, I don't want to. No, please go ahead. To speak more than uh, than I should. <laughs> this is why I was volunteering you. But in any case, just a few remarks. And obviously, the questions are huge, and I won't be able to do justice to them. Uh, Am and Lilian uh, have already pointed out uh, the irony of uh, this thing taking place, oh, and Pedro also mentioned it, uh, in a moment in which uh, there is uh, an increasing turn to the right uh, politically, which one would think uh, doesn't make this uh, the most auspicious uh, time to deal with uh, a topic such as uh, the history of uh, colonialism. Uh, however, I think that one has to interpret this uh, in uh, taking seriously both sides of this uh, moment of political contestation in which, yes, there is a trend to political, uh, to the right amongst political elites, but it's not necessarily the case that uh, there is a turn to the right amongst the populations as a whole. And uh, I think that this again opens up uh, some uh, opportunities and some possibilities 
which needed to be husbanded and taken care of with some prudence. Uh, Ezra mentioned that the risk of backlash, and I think that this is a real one. Transitional justice measures, generally speaking, have tended to uh, awaken huge expectations. And uh, I have to say that uh, transitional justice practitioners have not always been sufficiently aware of, for example, the long time that it takes for transitional justice measures to have to manifest their positive effects. I think that the technocratic bent of transitional justice led practitioners in general to think that this was a question of in a few years establishing institution, new institutions, reforming some old ones, and that within a three to five year period, problems would be solved. A witness, for example, the resolution on Sri Lanka, the Human Rights Council, which co-sponsored by Sri Lanka itself in, in, uh, in 2015, promised that in two years, the country would establish all the relevant transitional justice measures. And in fact, to be perfectly honest, none of them was established. And now under a new government, the likelihood is uh, uh, practically zero. So I think that this does call for a certain type of realism and an understanding of the dynamics of institutional change which are more complicated, less linear, and much more protracted in time than people think. But I don't think that we should be shying away from pushing the envelope because just as there are movements to the right, there is increased activism of a progressive sort that also needs to be supported. On the question of solidarity, if I, if I understood it correctly, I think that one of the advantages of the very steep learning curve about transitional justice implemented at the national level is that there is a great deal of communication amongst transitional justice initiatives across national borders. So though there are at present no cross-border transitional justice initiatives to speak of. Uh, Truth Commission for the Balkans regions, for example, which has long been on the agenda, is not making progress. Tra different transitional justice initiatives across the Israel-Palestinian border have never prospered. Uh, there is a lot of transitional justice uh, uh, activism in the Great Lakes region that should really be uh, transnational in nature which again has not worked out uh, 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 that way. So there is very little experience, but there is already a network of communication across transitional justice uh, topics that I think could be the base for the sort of solidarity that I at least think that the question was uh, referring to. And finally, on which groups deserve a transitional justice attention. I am involved with some transitional justice, incipient transitional justice initiatives in the US-Mexico border, which of course doesn't refer primarily to the transitional justice impetus that the Black Lives Matter has given to the examination of relations with African-Americans, a rather different group, but I think moved by the same sort of currents. And I think that at the local level, which in countries like the US, for example, very large, federally organized politically, and with a huge diversity 
of uh, uh, groups. Initiatives at the local level can be uh, much more responsive to the needs of the local constituencies than completely federal large scale initiatives. And I think that there is some importance to that and some interesting precedents, for example, in Brazil and other fe large federally organized state which eventually had a federal truth commission and a federal reparations program, but that was preceded by a plethora of uh, local level uh, truth initiatives, including some uh, at the level of a university in Sao Paulo, uh, but also at the city level. And I don't think that one should discount uh, uh, initiatives that are taking place at the subnational level just as one should not discount initiatives that take place at the supranational level. This is a moment which is, I think, pregnant with opportunities. None of them easy. Uh, none of them, uh, one should be naive about uh, the, the fact that they will prosper. But all of us who are interested in this sort of both reckoning with the past and uh, using the reckoning as the establishment for a new form of solidarity, to be perfectly honest, and not to speak about the fact that the pandemic right now gives us an incentive to rethink very seriously the way that we deal with one another and with the environment would be kind of absurd. Uh, without being naive, I think that we should uh, do our best uh, to uh, support initiatives that uh, take place at this very different levels of action. So. Yeah, and I can actually piggyback on on your points, Pablo. I think your point about the temporality of these these movements is is incredibly important, and maybe allows us to, allows me to speak to two of the questions about the one about the backlash, and then the one about um, the risks in creating these linkages. Um, because, and and I think part of the question about the that you you reframed as a about you know this white backlash and the fact that it feels like we keep starting from zero um yes and also i think i think kind of taking in mind wouldn't it be nice if in three years we were done with racism right like i mean right? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice that'd be amazing but none of us believe that that's actually possible right so on some level we are fully aware that these are processes that are going to unfold over decades right it took it took it took a few centuries to get here it's going to take a little while to to get out of here um but th that doesn't mean that there isn't so even though there's a sense of like kind of starting over each time it doesn't mean that there isn't incremental movement right even just seeing what happened, like the, what's brought us here today, the way that this BLM, you know, with all its issues, right? Like you don't have to be 100% behind BLM, you don't have to be with them at all, but seeing that, seeing the way that that mobilized, that that um, ignited or kind of provided um, a point of rallying for movements across the world and to bring millions of people together, right? There's something that's shifting. There's new language that's being made acceptable, right? We're talking about global white supremacy now today, like, you know, we're using these words in a way that's acceptable that wouldn't have been two years ago, right? So there, there are huge changes that are happening. And this goes back to Pablo's point about, you know, the fact that this is not about um, uncovering new knowledge, it's about socializing this knowledge. It's about changing the terms in which we talk about the past and, and the ways that we recognize the legacies of the past in our everyday um, environment. And all of that is changing. And I mean, and, and it might be changing incrementally, frustratingly, kind of two steps forward, one step back, but these things are moving. And this moment is really crucial in, in what's happening. And I think a lot of it has to do with a few things with who is involved, right? The fact that you have um, more and more thinking about the European case in particular, people who are straddling multiple worlds at the time. So multiple wor worlds geographically, but also in terms of their areas of practice, right? The fact that you have these academics who are also activists, who are also artists, who are um, European and African and, Amer and American and African, or, you know, that are kind of living across these worlds. Um, and, and that you have new tools, the way that BLM became what BLM is was starting from a hashtag right now i'm completely technologically challenged but <laughs> most people thankfully many people are not right and so you have these tools twitter these hashtags that do make um 
um, kind of connecting and, 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 and mobilizing people possible in a way that, again, wasn't, um, you know, a decade ago, right? So you have, um, you have there is there is change happening um and and we and we know that the temporality of this is not this is not going to be a matter of just a couple of years and i think that's super that's incredibly important to recognize um and also and i guess let's see so i guess just to speak to the risk question i think obviously the risk is um you know the the the, the possibility of making this an americano centric thing right so saying this is a blm thing that's playing out everywhere um or that that these american somehow this, I don't even know, I mean, that, that uh, the American ways of framing the issue is going to take over what's happening in other countries. And I think, you know, maybe this is because I'm an anthropologist, but all we have to do is look at what people are doing on the ground. Like, how are the activists using these tools, these, these, this language, the, the apparatuses that exist, um, how are they using it to in their particular context, right? So the, we can look at it from the outside. And so there's a risk that this becomes, you know, this American, Thing, but I think that's not giving enough credit to the, the people who are involved and to their ability to use and to reinterpret and to apply these tools and concepts to their particular context. Um, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. And I'll just say that I think, you know, this isn't, I think the Black question has always been a transnational question, right? It, it's always, there, there, there've always, there've been movement like Pan-Africanism that linked the fates of Africa-based African people and African people in the diaspora. And so in some respects, when we look at this, this is not, that's another way that this is not a new, a fully new moment, right? And I think as a way to maybe consider these points of rallying across European countries, across um, Europe, Africa, and the US within a longer, um, a longer history of um, transnational um, alliances around um, the liberation of Black people specifically. Can Thank I, you very much, I, Pedro. Yes. Yes, I, I, I just want to kind of uh, reinforce and kind of echo uh, a lot of what I must just said and was very useful. But uh, yeah, I think the question about the risk. So I, I, I'm kind of like not so much, not so worried about uh, the risk for different reasons. But you know, I think well, one is uh, so yes, I guess to me BLM represents one set, one trend within uh, uh, Black American politics. So it, there's the you know kind of a complexity of what. Uh, the, 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 the debate and the field of black politics in the US. And I think what I see in BLM is this more internationalist kind of engagement uh, with uh, anti-racism. Um, and so that's, that's for maybe one reason uh, that I'm not so worried about kind of these uh, encounters. The second reason, reason, I think we've talked about that also, but there is, uh, there is local dynamics, I guess, you know, within Belgium, uh, there are groups that uh, you know have been kind of advocating, mobilizing for years already. So this is not just a kind of uh, you know um, uh, just reaction to uh, 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 events happening in the U.S. Uh, it, there is like this important rules, and I think the last reason uh, has to do with intellectual histories uh, um, of um, um, you know a, a black radical tradition. Uh, so. Uh, Black internationalism, we mentioned that already, but also the, 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 the history of Belgian colonialism. So that was part of like my, uh, the points I tried to make uh, uh, during my, my comments, but I think it's important to look at, uh, and, and that was also, uh, I think, uh, a point that uh, uh, I made, but to look at uh, um, uh, you know, colonialism in Central Africa, uh, in, you know, in a global context. I think that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a history, a process that kind of, you know, uh, uh, interpolated, the, you know, the whole world somehow. And I think that's, a, uh, it's important to uh, also open the doors and, uh, uh, you know, to, to approach the, the question of uh, uh, reconciliation, you know, uh, 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 coming to terms with the colonial past also with that in mind as not, uh, you know, it's not a question that's, uh, you know, that can be contained within uh, a couple, you know, two nation states or, uh, uh, or uh, but that's, that's as this kind of like uh, amplitude uh, that, that we should uh, keep in mind. Um, thank you very much. We are uh, over our time, um, but uh, is there a burning comment that you would like to make before we close? Anyone? 
Okay. Well, I would like to thank all our speakers so much for this wonderful, uh, very informative, very thought um, thoughtful um, set of presentations and discussion as well. And I would also like to thank uh, our attendees uh, for their questions. Uh, let me share my screen for what is coming up. Um, so um, here is our poster. Um, uh, of the events that we have already organized and we will be organizing. Our next event is uh, March 15, uh, Germany to Germany, new perspectives on post-war, post-unification and post-colonial reparations. And we also have panels about uh, reparations to post-Soviet Russia and to climate refugees. Um, so please uh, join us in those uh, panels uh, as well, if you're interested. Um, and thank you very much again to all our speakers. Thank you so much, Estra. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this was wonderful. I learned a lot. Thanks. Likewise. Uh,